morning. It's always a blessing to be here with you. I uh, really have sincerely appreciated the fellowship we feel with uh, this body in Christ. Uh, we appreciate your, the spirit we find here among you, but uh, also the, the willingness to come and uh, work alongside us uh, in China to pray for us. Uh, you've sent uh, financial donations and been our friends and uh, we really feel welcome here and, and uh, supported by all of you. So thank you for all of that. We've, uh, we've been praying uh, with you for, for Paul and his health and the upcoming surgery and uh, uh, really uh, find him to be a, a great brother in the Lord. And, I'm sure you all appreciate him also. Let's keep praying for them. Um, I was going to comment on Laura's new tattoos as a joke this morning, but I decided against it. Uh, so so I, I just won't say anything. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to ask her about that. It's not true. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you a little, a little story about um, a guy that I was discipling some time ago, and, and uh, we were meeting together, going out to one of the ministries he was operating. We a lot of what we actually do now is discipling house church pastors. We have really put the Chinese in control of pretty much everything. Even our organization now is uh, led by uh, national Christian leaders and all, all of our sites other than one, which will soon be being turned over to a national leader. So um, what we do is, is disciple Chinese Christian leaders. And I, I was doing that some time ago with, with a, a friend and uh, as we were going out to where we were going to do something with some people that he was ministering among, I, I had asked him how the prayer meeting was going at his church. And he said, uh, I, I abandoned the prayer meeting. We don't, we don't have prayer meetings anymore. Which is very surprising. Uh, the, the Chinese house churches are very fervently prayerful, usually on a Sunday morning, there'll be like an hour, sometimes more, of prayer mixed in with each Sunday service. And um, even most churches then will have a, a time of prayer during the week that might go on two or three hours on one evening. It's actually quite, quite normal for most house churches to have that. So to hear him say that uh, they were not going to have the prayer meeting anymore uh, was a bit of a surprise, and I asked him why. And he said, well, something's wrong, and I don't know what it is, but I know that what we're doing must not be pleasing to God. He said, he, he, God doesn't answer our prayers, so maybe we've got some other problem, maybe we've got some sin in the church. Uh, Maybe he doesn't like the way we pray, but I decided that uh, until we figure out what's wrong, uh, we're not going to keep praying because if God isn't answering our prayers, uh, there's a problem with us, not with him. I thought that sounded uh, like a very reasonable and uh, intelligent and wise thing, not, not necessarily to stop praying, but to, to have the reason that he had for not praying. He said, what, what do you think? What do you think is wrong with us? I said, let's, let's read a verse uh, that talks about this. Maybe, maybe in that verse we'll find something that uh, is the problem in your, your prayers. So I, I had him uh, open up his Bible to Mark chapter 11, verse the end of verse 22, you can look at that, Mark 11, 22, right, right at the end, Jesus begins by saying, have faith in God. 
uh, you're, you're all very familiar, I'm sure, with this passage. Um, quite loud. Is it the right, uh, can you hear me when I, my head isn't down? Okay. I'll keep my head up then. <laughs> Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. And we, we read through that, and he was looking at it, and I, I said, you know, that, that last line is interesting. Um, it says, believe that you have already received them while you're praying and they'll be granted to you. I said, I know that often I myself have failed to do this. I, I haven't <coughs> prayed, uh, I haven't spent the time in the presence of God, talking with God, uh, listening to God, waiting upon God, being near to God, to the point where He has established in me, by my being there with Him, this Thing that he's asking of me, this believing that I've already received what I was asking for so that he might grant it to me. I said, I haven't met the conditions of God's request. I don't stay near him. I don't pursue him. I don't remain there in his presence until this point of arriving at these, this, this uh, belief that he's ask and therefore sometimes often maybe if I'm not doing this if I'm not taking the time if I'm not abiding near him in my prayers uh, perhaps he's not answering my prayers because of that there might be other reasons maybe I've got some unconfessed sin that's also another condition or answering prayer and scripture, but today I want to talk about this idea that is in this verse. That, that young man, he he said, you know, I I think you've identified it. We we come together and and we love God and we have some faith in God, but mostly we just come and we we go through lists of things that we de desire from God or that. I and mean, we might even be praying to God or worshiping God, but when it comes to expressing to God things that uh, we want to pray for, we perhaps are never even coming close to what he asks in that verse, that we will pray until we believe that we have already the, the tense of that Greek verb is a, a completed action in the past. And we pray until we have already believed that we have those things and then they're granted to us. We pray until there is a knowledge from God, a gift from God, a faith in God, an assurance in God that this thing is done, this thing is over, this is settled. God and I have arrived at an agreement. He's, he's given me a, a gift somehow, an assurance, of, a peace of heart, a knowledge of His faithfulness that, that doesn't waver. We're going to read another verse uh, about this same thing concerning Abraham. It says he didn't waver in unbelief, but he believed. And I, I want to throw this out as something that uh, actually is quite important. We, we teach this idea in China to people who we are discipling. And, and it's actually throughout the New Testament we find this being taught. This idea of uh, a full assurance of faith in the presence of God as being 
a requirement from God from his side, a, a, a request to us, a condition of him answering prayer, that we will pray through to having received from him this belief, this trust, this faith. If you look in, in, a, in a verse that you're all very familiar with, in, in every translation it says something a little bit different. But uh, one of the common translations of uh, Hebrews 11, um, talking about faith and the nature of faith, he says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He, he doesn't like my message at all. I was, I was hoping it would disturb the rest of you that much. We'll see how it goes. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And it, it, it really makes the two things equivalent. Faith and assurance. Uh, it, you, you find the same comparison in this verse we're going to read about Abraham. That he didn't waver in unbelief, that, but he had an assurance from God that what God had said would happen. That assurance and this concept of faith cannot be separated. You can't have faith, you can't have great faith, real faith, fullness of faith, without this assurance within. You can't have assurance separated from faith. They, they are the same thing. The one defines the other. And, and the Bible's filled with verses about faith that are discuss, discussing the reality of the assurance that comes with that. And I want to talk about that today. If we, if we go back in, in history and we look uh, about 150 years ago, you find it very common that people are talking um, or writing about um, praying through to an assurance, or they often called it praying the prayer of faith. Um, the, the quote from the book of James. Um, the prayer of faith means um, a time of prayer where one arrives at that point where this gift of God, prayer is a gift. You can't make it happen. You, can, you can't uh, try, try to concentrate and, and make it arrive inside. Um, it's a gift of God. And, and so this gift of God they, they spoke of, they pursued. They stayed in the presence of God until this gift of God came. And there was a fullness of assurance. There's a little quote from a, a book about Hudson Taylor, a biography um, written actually by uh, Hudson Taylor's sister based on uh, things that she knew about Hudson Taylor from, from her close relationship with him. And, and actually this part comes from her mother. Um, and it's a, a little quote out of this book called uh, Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret by Dr. and Mrs. Howard Taylor. Um, and here's, here's the, the quote talking about this concept that uh, I'm uh, getting us to focus on this morning. Hudson Taylor's mother was especially burdened that afternoon about her only son. She went alone to plead with God for his salvation. Hour after hour passed upon her knees until her heart was flooded with a joyful assurance that her prayers were heard and answered heart was flooded with a joyful assurance that her prayers were heard and answered. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. She, she probably prayed many, many times before for the salvation of her son. And I, I think she'd gotten to the same point about these prayers that uh, my friend, this pastor, back in China had, had come to. He said, uh, somehow something's wrong. Well, she probably knew what was wrong because it was a common thinking, a common teaching, a common pursuit in the church 150 years ago. 
but today it's, for the most part, gone from the church. Of course, I, I meet people who practice this, but uh, the reality is it's, it's not a common thing in our churches. We, we have more of the sort of prayers in general that my pastor was talking about, that they, they get together and list off the things they want from God and spend a, a few moments on each one and, and move on. They've prayed for them. But uh, the reality is uh, we haven't prayed from the fullness of faith. We, we haven't prayed with great faith. We've prayed with little faith. If you, if you look in Scripture, it's, it's very clear that there are groups of verses about several different points on a spectrum of faith. If you think of faith as a spectrum, and from here to here, you know, this, this is a fullness of assurance out here at the end of the spectrum, a fullness of faith. God's given you the whole gift of faith. You can't get any more. He has assured your heart. He has established peace within your inner person about something, about his will, about something you're asking for, about many, many things. doesn't matter. But you have arrived at uh, what Jesus called great faith when he was talking about the centurion who had come to him and had great faith that Jesus could heal his son from a great distance if he only spoke a word. He said, great faith is in this man. He said, even in Israel, I don't find this great faith. But over here on the other end, there's little faith. And Jesus calls it that many times. Oh, ye of little faith, why do you not believe? And they, they lack something. And yet, think about it. They, they have faith. So over here, th this, this spectrum is all a spectrum of faith. There, there's little faith and there's great faith. In between, in the middle, there's, there's a bit of faith, a partial faith, a needing to grow faith. Like, like the man whose, whose son uh, couldn't be healed by the disciples. And, and uh, uh, the disciples are asking Jesus, Later, you know, what, what happened? But, well, the story is interesting that the man had come to the disciples with, with his son. And they were praying and, and couldn't heal the son by their prayers. And, and then Jesus comes after he, he's just been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he, he comes down to this place where they're all standing around and talking about this. And, and he, he steps in and recognizes what's going on, and, and he, he asks the man in relation to the healing of his son. The man, the man says, can you heal him? And, and Jesus says to the man, do you believe? You know, he, he was putting it back into the man's hands to believe. And the man has a, a very interesting answer, which, which is a, a great uh, description of being sort of in the middle of this spectrum of faith. He says, I believe. Help my unbelief. And, and he did believe. He, he was there asking the disciples of Jesus because there was a degree of faith in him. There was faith there. But uh, when Jesus asked him about it, he, he told the truth. He told the reality. He, he knew there was some degree of unbelief. He knew he didn't have yet this full assurance of faith that God asks us for. And so he said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that's, that's actually a, a very great prayer to pray if you happen to be sitting in the middle of that <clears throat> spectrum of faith. And I mean, it's, it's God is not angry about any, any of this. Uh, when we are on this spectrum of faith, we have faith. Now, he, he might be grieved, and he often is not answering if we're over at this little faith end of things. He certainly wasn't answering the prayers of the disciples that day because they were over here on the little faith end of the spectrum, and God was waiting for greatness of faith. 
And of course, he's, he still answers many prayers. I've had uh, little faith about many, many, many things in my life. And God graciously answers. And I think he, he knows what's, what's best for me and for whatever I'm praying for. And the, the people around me, he's, he's gracious, he's patient. He sometimes grieves over my littleness of faith as Jesus grieved over the little faith of the disciples. And so God's not going to necessarily sit and refuse to uh, do anything until you meet the conditions because he's a merciful God. And sometimes he says, well, I think it would be best for this child right now if I answer the prayer even though the faith is little. He, he, he or she has not spent the time in my presence that it would take to arrive at a full assurance of faith. And so on this particular thing, I think it best to, to answer the prayer. So he does. And maybe sometimes that's uh, deceiving for us. Not that God deceives, but that we deceive ourselves into thinking that we've met the conditions of prayer that God's put in Scripture. Actually, the only thing that's happened is uh, the mercy of God has answered a prayer for one of us who has little faith that day. Or uh, maybe we're like this man who believes, but still in part doesn't believe, but certainly doesn't have this greatness of faith that Jesus describes in other passages. Now, I, I want us to ask ourselves today about how it is that we tend to pray. You know, do we think that just taking a few moments to step into the, the presence of God and state a desire is, is uh, something that we can then expect God to fulfill or is it, in fact, uh, not something He's promised, even though we, we think we believe in faith, do we actually believe in something much smaller than what God is asking for? That, that young pastor that I was talking about in the story at the beginning, I, I challenged him with this. I said, what if you got your group together and you found several verses in Scripture to um, learn from, to uh, teach yourselves from, and you acknowledge this idea that perhaps God is waiting until you spend time with Him, you live near Him, you abide in Him, you worship Him in truth, you uh, stay there and meditate upon Him and, and His uh, attributes, His goodness, His kindness, His beauty, his holiness, his promises, and you let all of those things together come into your heart and establish this thing that he wants from you, this fullness of assurance. And you just take one item from your list, instead of reading him off the list of 20 or 30 or, or 100 things that you were hoping to pray about, and, and just take one of them. And as a group in Christ, you, you pray through to a full assurance of faith and put that back into the presence of God, this gift of faith that he's just given you, this assurance that he has come and established in your heart because you've stayed there looking at all that he is, recognizing the reality of God's faithfulness, of God's power of his being able to be trusted. You know, we spend time there with him and we, we, we open the word and, and we look and we find him there and everything in there that we find, you know, his goodness and mercy and power and holiness and, and faithfulness. And, and what it does is it begins to be his instrument of convincing us that what he has said he will do, he will do. And he uses the word to establish this assurance within us about him. Assurance that he is faithful. 
to do what he has promised, that he's able, that he's faithful, that he desires to fulfill what we are asking. And we, we spend the time there. I, I mean, I was challenging this young man. Why, why not take one thing and test it out? Instead of stopping prayer meetings where you're listing off 50 items that you'd like to have from God, why not pick one of those things and persist together in prayer until there's a fullness of assurance established within you and then you, you take that faith back into the presence of God and say, okay, God, you've granted this thing that you require from us. You've established uh, a great faith within us about your faithfulness. We come back to you now in true faith, in great faith, in fullness of faith, as you've asked and we ask you for this thing. And, and now we, we believe that we've received because you have established that belief within us, and so we know that it will be granted. There's a really great story in a biography of Watchman Nee, um, who uh, had a, a very, very interesting life in China. And he talks about this prayer of faith at one point when he's preaching through the book of James. And he says, um, when I was a young pastor, I, I came down with tuberculosis, and uh, I prayed for myself many times that God would take away the tuberculosis, and he didn't, and I, I would, you know, spend a few minutes a day, and several of my friends were praying for me, and um, I got worse and worse and worse. The doctor said, uh, put your things in order, you will die soon, and I, I kept uh, bringing my little faith prayers into the presence of God, and, and uh, one of my friends came and said, I, I don't think you are um, actually praying the prayer of faith. He said, why, why not think that uh, what you need to uh, truly meet the, the, the desires of God in relation to your prayers about your healing, uh, what, what if you took it seriously and, and just prayed fasted and prayed until God established that within you. And, and he did, actually. He, he gathered two or three friends together and they fasted and prayed for a few days. I don't remember how long. And um, they, um, after two or three days, I think, um, he got a full assurance of faith that God had healed him. And he, he got up in joy and they uh, went and had a meal and uh, thanked the Lord that uh, he had answered the prayer. Because he, he had this conviction within, as Hebrews uh, chapter 11 calls it, uh, a conviction of something unseen, an assurance that God would fulfill his prayer. In fact, that he had fulfilled his prayer. And so they, they were joyful and, and uh, went away praising the Lord that um, he was guaranteed the healing of God through prayer. And a week went by and he got a little bit worse. And a week went by and he got a little bit worse. And another week went by and he began to be depressed and discouraged, no longer joyful and proclaiming the, the answer of prayer. and. And uh, he, he got quite angry at God and, and started uh, spending some time uh, alone with God to proclaim his anger at God. And uh, he, he said that one moment when I uh, had ceased uh, releasing my anger at God, and he, he was able to get a word in edgewise. He, he, he said to me, well, wh why did you throw away the, the faith that I gave you. I, I gave you the faith you needed to, to be healed and you tossed it aside because you wanted things done in some concept of your own timing rather than mine. But uh, I, I've given you uh, the knowledge, the assurance within, the peace of knowing that your prayers have been answered. Why, why not just embrace this and continue? as if you 
in fact had received what I gave him. And he immediately realized that the truth of what he had just heard from God's Spirit, that he was not, in fact, following what God had given him. And he confessed his sin and, and got up again joyful, saying, God is, is going to heal me soon. And he was actually quite near death at the end of all of this. In fact, he, uh, it seems to me, I, I think the book says he could hardly even get up and walk at that point. And within a few days, the Lord healed him completely of his tuberculosis, just removed all of it from inside uh, at, at one moment. And the, the tuberculosis was just gone. And he went on with uh, uh, really quite an amazing ministry all across China. But uh, it's, it's an interesting example of, of sometimes, you know, God uses this in different ways. You know, what, what is God after? What's, what's he looking for that makes him do things this way? I think it's actually not such a difficult question to answer, but most of the time we don't see it right off the bat. You know, Christianity isn't about doing things for God or activities or or, uh, you know, evangelism or knowledge of the Bible. Those are the fruits of real Christianity, the fruits of a life with God, the fruits of an abiding with God in His presence, of going back uh, into Him day by day by day, and as David said, being satisfied by the presence of God, having His thirst quenched and His hunger appeased for the presence of God. Christianity is about a heart like David's, satisfied in God, enjoying being with Him, knowing Him more deeply, more fully, more honestly, more in truth, finding that koinonia, that love expressed in, in the intimate presence that we are offered with it, that fellowship with God, that sharing together his heart, his desires, his pursuits, his purposes in the world and in our lives. That's Christianity. It's this relational interaction with God where we find his presence, his desires satisfying us. And as he satisfies us, our affections are for him. Our desire, our delight, our love, our hope are toward Him. This is Christianity, not uh, activities, not being a missionary in China, doing evangelism and planting churches. Those are just fruits of relationship. A knowledge of the Bible, a fruit of a relationship with God in which His Spirit comes and teaches you the meanings of what he wrote here. You know, love for one another. You, you can't make it happen. But it's a fruit of life with Jesus, of walking with God, of listening to the Spirit, of being filled by the life that is in Jesus Christ who now lives within us. All of these things we think of, you know, community in Christ, uh, the social justice that we seek, the, the wisdom, the, the fulfillment, the, the filling of the spiritual gifts that God has given us. All of them are just the fruits of relationship with Him. And this is another one of them. A full assurance of faith. There's a great uh, description of this. I want, I want us to read it in Colossians uh, chapter 4, I think, verse 12. It's where Paul is uh, talking about how Epaphras has been praying for the Colossians. And he identifies the thing that Epaphras has been praying for the Colossian Christians. If you, if you look uh, in verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, Epaphras was a Colossian, who was 
working somewhere else with Paul. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings. Always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. An interesting prayer. That the Colossian Christians would have a full assurance of the will of God within them. A great prayer. I think uh, I, I do a lot of speaking with uh, young, younger groups because there's hope that some of them will change, unlike people my age. And uh, so I, I tend to speak um, with younger Christian groups in, in different places. And um, what, probably the most common question, you know, people come up after or during a meal or we're traveling together or whatever. And perhaps the most commonly asked question I get is in some form a question about, you know, how do I know the will of God? What, what is the will of God for me? Tell me the will of God. You know, that's a common one. They, they think, oh, I'm going to tell them. You know, you know, God's going to tell you His will for you. But His will is not the important thing as much as your relationship with him that brings him to tell you his will, to give your heart a full assurance of faith about his will. Now you, you can go find his will, but you want that relationship, that intimacy, that interaction with him that he's waiting for. That's God's silent. He wants relationship. He wants to have a child love him in the same way we want our children to love us. That's what he's waiting on. And, and so these, these young people are asking me this question over and over and over. How do I know the will of God? Well, here's what it is. You, know, you, you spend time with God. You live in his presence. You meditate upon who he is. You worship Him in spirit and in truth. You cry out to Him whenever there's a cry in your heart for whatever. You abide near Him. You abide in Him. And you establish that life with Him. And He'll come and give you this thing that Epaphras was praying. A full assurance of all the will of God. I got a letter this morning from a young man that I was... I've been talking to for a few months since uh, I preached in a church and, and he came up and said, I, I've been thinking that uh, maybe it's God's will for me to quit my job as an engineer and to serve him full time. And, and we've been going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, and this morning, uh, we've probably literally written uh, 25 letters back and forth in the last three months. And, and this morning, I, I, I showed him several verses about having a full assurance of all the will of God. And, and he said, you're right, that's, that's what I need. But tell me how to do that. How do I find myself? Uh, he said, right now I desire God. I want to serve Him. I'm willing to give up my nice, comfortable job to go serve Him full time in a job that probably won't give me half as much money as I'm presently making. We'll have to sell our house and, and get a much smaller one. I'm willing to do all of that, but I don't know God's will. And I said, well, well, more so than needing to know God's will, you need that relationship with Him. That enjoyment from your inner person toward Him. That satisfaction in him that David said was the one thing he desired. He said, one thing I desire to dwell in your tabernacle and to gaze upon your beauty. And, and I, I, I sent him a, a list of several psalms to, to go look up. I said, there in those psalms is, is a, a great number of verses describing the heart of David that in Acts chapter 13, it says, uh, here's, here's the only person in the whole Bible 
declared as the one who uh, has a heart after God's own heart. That's what David had. So why not follow his example and have that heart, which is after God's own heart. And so what, it, what does that look like? Well, it was where the affections of David were constantly towards the Father. He talks about the satisfaction he gets from being in the presence of God. He talks about the joy, the rejoicing from seeing the face of God. He talks about how he's awakened in the night to fulfill this thing that he desires to be found in the presence of God and the satisfaction, the peace that it gives him inside from having been there. There's the heart of David, one that's, he's not seeking activities, he's, he's not seeking, you know, what project can I go do for God next? He's not seeking wisdom, he's, he's just seeking the person of God himself. That's what he wants. His affections are toward the person of God. And all of these other things are added. And, and that's our promise. That's what God has said to us, that if we will pursue this relationship with him through worship, through reading his word, through meditation upon his person and character, to you know, being often in his presence with, with a heart that goes out to him, with affections that are pointed towards him because he's the one who deserves them. You know, he's, he's worthy of our affections, our honor, our joy, our trust, our satisfaction our love, on and on and on. No one else is even worthy. Of course, as we become like him, we will have some of those affections for others who need them because his affections are for them. You know, in, as my affections toward God grow, he establishes within me his affections for all people. His love, his grace, his patience. His desire. You can ask my wife, I'm still lacking a little patience and a few other things here and there. But, but the point is, we, we know the problem. I've not been there in His presence enough to receive these things. When I'm lacking them, you know, it, it's not for some sort of a failure in His promises or His faithfulness. Whenever I'm lacking any of these things, what I lack is having been there with Him, to experience Him, to enjoy Him, to let my heart be satisfied by and drawn to Him, to let Him establish faith and love and humility so that I will go there as David did into His presence and enjoy Him, be satisfied by Him. That's how we grow faith, by taking a look at the faithful one from closer Proximity. That's all it requires. Draw near. Be, be with Him. Abide in Him. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Just persist at these things. And it takes time to do that. You don't just say, okay, I'm going to do that and go home and poof, it's all done. It's a relationship. It, it takes time. But, but the important idea to remember in that is God is patient. He's gracious. He's kind. He's gentle. He's forgiving. He's loving. He's merciful. He's powerful to transform the things within us that are not there yet. Okay, God is that way. And so this works. When I say, okay, I'll... I'll pursue that. I'll pursue this life with God that brings about these fruits, this, this one being one of them, a, a way of praying like Christ did with full assurances of faith offered back to God, a gift from Him to me offered back to Him. 
full assurance of faith taken into his presence and spent there, which then produces, as Jesus said, what, whatever you ask. And so I want, I want us to think, you know, what, what are all of the things about which we pray that are not being fulfilled? You know, there are many if, if you are like me, like most of us. But we know the problem. The problem isn't on God's side. It's, it's very clearly right here with me if I'm praying and there is no response from God. We, we can go and spend time in His presence. Maybe sometimes He'll change my prayer. Sometimes He'll show me that my ideas, my thoughts are not aligned with His, and He'll align them. And then the things about which I pray are now His will. I saw one of you had a, a nice uh, shirt from Psalm 37, 4, uh, that, that talks about um, God establishing the desires of our heart within us. Sometimes He just gives us the desires that he has already put there. Other times uh, he establishes his desires within us that become our new pursuit. But our heart becomes aligned with his in terms of what we're pursuing. But, but the reality is I think there is a, a general lack in the church of praying this prayer of faith after having received from God a great faith, a fullness of assurance. It's not so common. I, I don't see it very often. It takes time. It takes time and focus. It takes us away from other things. We, we have to spend that sacrificial time that it takes to have this relationship with God, this abiding. If, if we're not up in the morning and getting heart and mind very intentionally focused toward Him, this isn't going to happen that day. You know, I have to get my heart focused on Him, my affections directed toward Him, my desires aligned with His and focused toward Him, the delight of my heart Toward him, the thing that my heart worships. Worship is a presentation of myself to someone, something. We're all worshiping beings. Our heart, our affections are toward something every moment of every day. I need to get up in the morning and go into the presence of God until my affections are toward him. My satisfaction is in him. My desires are aligned with His, and sacrificially so. You know, this worship is the presentation to Him of all that I am and have to be spent by Him for His purposes, for His glory, for His desires, for His will. And without spending that time there with Him, so that my heart is ready to go through a day in this way, in this frame of mind, it, this isn't going to happen. I don't think these kinds of things are so common anymore, and yet the, the promises are here, just like they were for Hudson Taylor's mother. The promises haven't changed. God hasn't changed one tiny little bit. Uh, he is waiting that we might pursue this same type of life, this abiding life, this life which goes constantly to Him and looks to Him and desires and, and asks in faith that says to him, you know, if maybe the thing I like is just the faith. I say, God, give me the faith. And I stay there until I have it. I remain in his presence asking, pursuing, until he establishes it within me. Just, just as Hudson Taylor's mother, it says she was on her knees for hours and, until a joyful assurance arrived. Now there's the life that we're called to. You, know, you can look up calling from God in Scripture and it actually never talks about being sent 
to a place, uh, having a certain job or job description. Yet that's the way most of us talk about the idea of calling. But our calling, our primary calling, and this is word for word, is unto fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Koinonia is the word. Unto relations with Him that share all faiths, that have communion. The word communion is the same word, koinonia. I have a communion with Jesus. That is my calling. That's what we're called to. People ask me all the time, tell me what my calling is. I say, well, your, your calling is fellowship with Jesus Christ. And we're also called to holiness, and we're called to grace, and we're called to power and wisdom, and love, and on and on. But we're not called to places and job descriptions. We're called to be like Jesus Christ. That's our calling. And as we fulfill that, it is produced in the same way as this type of prayer that I'm encouraging you to pursue. It's found in the same way, through fellowship with God, with Jesus Christ Himself. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't, you can't produce it. You can't establish faith except through relationship with Him. And so I want to challenge you this morning. Are you willing to make those commitments to suffer the loss, whatever it's going to cost you to have this kind of a life with God? Are you willing to sacrifice those things? It's expensive. It costs time and energy. It steals the love that your heart has for whatever it has love for and refocuses it on God that you might then have even more love, His love for all the people on the earth who He loves. And it, it's a costly thing. Are you willing to pay the cost? Yeah, as Paul and Hoffer put it, the cost of discipleship. It's expensive. You want to follow Jesus. You want to be a disciple of Christ. It's expensive, costly. Are you willing to pay that cost of time and energy and focus and directing your love, your affections, your satisfactions and, and turning aside from the flesh and the world? That's the cost. And I want to ask you, are you willing to pay the cost? of having a prayer life like Christ's because that's being offered to us. A life in the presence of God wherein He establishes these things He's asking. Wherein our prayer lives become what the Bible says they will be. Are you willing to pay the cost of having that kind of relationship that will produce this kind of life that follows Jesus? There's the question. I'd like you to think about that. It's no small transaction. It is just a simple transaction, a willingness, a true willingness, a true worship, a true presentation to God of all that it costs to see this accomplished in your life. Are you willing for that? To spend what it will take to see these things a reality, these promises true within you. Let's just take a minute and just pray quietly and ask ourselves, are we, are, am I willing to pay this cost, to offer to God, to worship God with these things, he asks. Let's pray.
I'd like you to continue praying with your heads bowed, talking with the Lord, not with me or anyone else, but talking with Him about the same question. But I'd like um, those who uh, are going to help us with the invitation to come up, and uh, we'll we'll pray with you if this is what you're willing to commit to. And you know this question. What, what am I willing to give in exchange for this life in Christ that God is promising here? Will I pay the cost? And am I ready to worship as He requires? And if you are, I, I ask you to, to step down to the front here and uh, join us in the front for for prayer for you.